Okay, hello and welcome. This is Dr. Simeon Roger for the leader for the Leader Revolution, and this is our weekly briefing for decision makers on the Russia-Ukraine war. Will Russia end the war, or will the war end Russia? A very serious consideration. So let's go have a look at that. In last week's summary, I predicted that Putin's military situation in Ukraine was dire. And I'll have to stand by that prediction because, in fact, the evidence seems to support it. In this week's update, we're going to look at the current situation on the ground very quickly. We're going to spend more time on a few scenarios of how this could play out, as that is extremely important for decision makers to understand. And we're going to have some thoughts on what it may, might take or will take to permanently declaw the Russian bear, which has to be one of the key considerations for Western decision makers at this point. The current military situation, very simple. Russia's efforts continue to be hampered by number one, Russia continues to lose men and equipment at a rate that their ground forces, that is the Russian army, cannot sustain indefinitely. Thanks to the asymmetric tactics employed by the armed forces of Ukraine and in no small part to the Western arms that they have received. Number two, Russia has turned to an apparently deliberate policy of bombarding civilian areas, as you're no doubt aware, probably in a futile attempt to sap the will to resist, but also as leverage for negotiations. And finally, Russia has not yet achieved anything like air superiority, let alone air supremacy, nor has it suppressed Ukrainian air defenses adequately. So that's a quick summary of the military situation on the ground. Now, if you want to know more about the military situation, you could usefully check out last week's video where I went into a number of details about the military situation, uh, which are still entirely valid. So feel free to do that. Uh, one quick note, if uh, you're in a dis decision-making capacity, please do not be seduced by uh, sensationalist headlines. You probably saw this one a day or two ago. Russia uses hypersonic missile in Ukraine. And indeed, there is a MiG-31 with the hypersonic Kinjal missile strapped to its belly. Uh, but don't get distracted by this. Yes, they use their air-launched Kinjal missile. Now, Russia has been pounding Ukraine with hypersonic missiles since day one. I bet you didn't know that because that doesn't come out in the media. But to understand this, you have to understand what is Kinjal. Kinjal is nothing but the upper stage of the Iskander ground-launched ballistic missile. Iskander, Iskander M is fully hypersonic uh, easily. So this is basically just the upper stage of Iskander M strapped to the belly of a plane. Now, if you air launch part of a ballistic missile like this from medium to high altitude and you can't accelerate it to hypersonic speed, you should have your engineering degree revoked. Okay, so this doesn't really mean anything. And also Kinjal, this type of missile, this is not what we mean when we talk about hypersonic technology at all. Okay, so this is just cheap publicity and really nothing more. So don't be distracted. Always remember the media is looking for sensational headlines and is a little bit short on analysis. Now, Russia has made, the Russians have made few advances in recent days. And this becomes quite evident when we look at this map provided by the Institute for the Study of War and shared by the BBC. Uh, when we look at the situation, the map on the left is a week ago. Uh, the latest positions are on the right, valid as of yesterday. And when you look at the two maps, you'll see Russia has made almost no progress on any axes of attack, not the axis down from Kiev, not uh, the axis coming across from Kharkiv. So we'll just to show what those axes are, if we if we go here and take a look down from the Belarus border toward Kiev here. This axis of attack has made, made no progress really in surrounding Kiev. Uh, Kharkiv over here still holds out very easily. The Russians have, uh, indeed, they have surrounded Mariupol, which may well, well fall. Uh, they have taken uh, the cities of Kherson and uh, Melitopol, which is around here. But they have made virtually no progress in heading over here toward Mikolaev and Odessa. So that's a quick look at what they have, in fact, not achieved. Their, their operations are fun functionally stalled. And this is creating desperation for Putin, and we're seeing signs of desperation. Uh, we're seeing, first of all, the purging of his intelligence and military leadership. <clears throat> As you may be aware, at the end of last week, he went on quite a rant about finding traitors, which is, shows a good deal of paranoia. 
Uh, we know that Sergei Becerra, the, whole, the head of the uh, FSB's foreign intelligence arm, was relieved along with, I believe, his deputy, uh, General Roman Gavrilov, uh, deputy commander of Roskvardia, the Russian National Guard, which is also deployed in Ukraine. Uh, he was relieved. And according to some sources, up to eight generals have been fired, although we cannot substantiate that at the present time. We do know <clears throat> that Russia is pulling troops from its far eastern and eastern military districts, pulling troops out of Central Asia, Armenia, South Ossetia, and also from its military academies. So this shows a good deal of desperation. It also substantiates what we said last week, which is that Russia is very far from having uh, a huge pool of manpower. The Russian ground forces do not have much of a pool of manpower at all. And this is why Putin is turning to Sir Syrian mercenaries, for example, hoping to recruit them. Uh, this could be because he's looking toward urban combat, possibly in Kiev, and he's looking for people who understand urban combat. He may be keenly aware his own army does not. Uh, clearly, they are doing very poorly at that. Uh, he has, as far as we know, not been terribly successful at recruiting Syrian mercenaries. Uh, the rumor was he was looking for something like 16 to 20,000 of them. And as we're led to believe that at the current time, he only has about 1,000. Also, Chechen mercenaries. Uh, Chechen mercenaries uh, sent by uh, Chechen strongman uh, Rasman Kedyrov, a pro, the pro-Kremlin uh, leader of, uh, of Chechnya. Chechen mercenaries are already there. They are already in Ukraine. And yes, they are. they can make things difficult for the Ukrainians. There's no doubt about that. There was the idea of Chinese help that was floated uh, by the West. Now, has Putin actually asked for Chinese assistance? We do not know for sure, but what we do know is Western predictions based on intelligence information have been exceptionally accurate. Now, please keep in mind, this current briefing is based on open source intelligence only. Uh, we also have heard of potential false flag operations from the Russians designed to pull Belarus into the conflict. Uh, we have no further information on that right now, and we're not sure what Lukashenko's regime is going to do. So we're gonna look at some scenarios. How could this play out? Scenario number one, very simple, Putin declares victory and leaves. Uh, that's an ideal scenario really for everybody at this point, just about, uh, and it could well be what happens, but. Putin shows no sign of doing this. He doesn't seem to be aware of how desperate his own situation is and seems to be using the attitude in for a penny, in for a pound. He seems to be doubling down, uh, which, as we'll see, could be very hazardous for him in the long run. How, now, how could this work? In such a scenario, Ukraine might choose to concede uh, Crimea and, and possibly uh, the Donbass. And in order to secure the, the end of the war, an end to the war, an end to civilian casualties. Now, Ukraine might agree not to join NATO, at least officially, or to accept foreign troops or offensive weapons, not that it's ever had offensive weapons on its territory. Ukraine, however, would probably, in our view, would probably refuse to concede Black Sea access, which would be an economic disaster for Ukraine. It will probably also refuse to uh, concede the possibility of joining the European Union. That would probably be a step too far for Kyiv. Now, scenario number two, Putin continues the war for another month. What could this mean? Well, it will mean Russian losses will easily double, meaning 15 to 30,000 dead and the ground forces facing collapse. So the ground forces are one of the armed forces of the Russian Federation, like the aerospace forces, like the Navy. So the ground forces is essentially the equivalent of the U.S. Army, or uh, functionally the U.S. Army and Marines rolled into one because Russia's separate Marines are, are much smaller than the U.S. Marines. So the ground forces are really what make Russia a major Eurasian land power. And the idea that the ground forces could essentially collapse should be rather frightening to Putin. Uh, at this point, pulling out will become essential. If Putin, under pressure from his own people, still refuses, well, what then? If Putin has thoroughly doubled down and is refusing to see reality, what could happen in the Kremlin? Well, it's impossible to speculate. And speculation or Kremlinology is a very hazardous science, as we know. 
paranoid and alone, he has to be removed. But who will do it? That's the first question. Who will remove Putin? And the second is, well, even if Putin is removed, what's next for Russia? Is the regime that follows him following the same fundamental geopolitical ideology, or is it a fundamental change? Difficult to say. Let's look at a version of that that's a little different. Scenario 2A, Putin throws everything at the capture of Kyiv. And he seems to be obsessed with Kyiv, so we'll see what happens here. Kyiv, however, is now a fortress, and it won't be taken easily. The Ukrainians have had endless time to prepare. Lots of supplies are there. They have all the supplies. They have the weapons they need. They have the fighters they need. Uh, this will not be taken easily. Now, remember, Russia reached Kyiv on day one of this offensive. But here we are on day 26, and they still have not succeeded in even surrounding it. Will they try to reduce it to rubble first? So if there is an attempt to take Kiev, will they try to reduce it to rubble first? Well, very possibly because this seems to be the default setting. We've seen this with Kharkiv, especially with Mariupol in the south. This is quite possible. It would require artillery, not air power primarily. Uh, the Russian Air Force is really not equipped and not properly configured to reduce a large area to rubble using conventional, conventional weapons. And in fact, that's the case for almost any modern air force. Uh, the United States Air Force is probably the only air force who could do that. So for the Russians, artillery would become essential. Now, that's not really a problem. Artillery is a Russian specialty. They have tons of it. Uh, so that's probably what they would use. However, rubble is very defensible. Just say it. Reducing Kiev to rubble is not doing the, the attacking forces any favors. It's really doing a favor to the defenders. And here we could very well ask Putin, do you remember the last time you tried this, at least the last time your country tried this? Let's go back to Berlin in 1945. Uh, Berlin was already rubble when you approached it in March and April 1945. Then you pounded it with 20,000 guns and Katyusha rocket launchers. And taking it still cost you another 10,000 lives. So reducing a city to rubble does not end the possibility or the probability of urban combat by a determined defender. This will not save your lives. Not at all. And it doesn't guarantee you will ever take the city. Or if you do, it may consume your ground forces and be the end of, of, of any military viability of the Russian ground forces for the foreseeable future. Under scenario 2B, Let's say that Putin captures Kiev after a very costly battle. What would he be looking at? Well, the first question for us to ask as decision makers is, so what? This would be a symbolic victory, but probably a Pyrrhic victory too, because of the losses inflicted on the ground forces. <clears throat> the legitimate government of Ukraine could continue uh, from Lviv and Western Ukraine with or without President Zelensky, and the Ukrainians have undoubtedly made preparation for continuity of government. Putin is still left occupying very little of Ukraine's total territory and is unable to secure even that. He faces a hostile population with a well-armed and highly motivated insurgency, and he doesn't have the troops to quell it, having sent his remaining ground forces to die in a meat grinder. And if he thinks that his Rosgvardia troops, the National Guard troops, uh, can adequately quell a resistance, he is dreaming in technicolor. So sooner or later, Ukraine will recover all of its territory and its capital. That's almost inevitable. There is no long-term or even medium-term outcome here that's really, truly advantageous to Putin. So is this man deluded or is he simply being fed bad information? Well, who did Putin rely on for his intelligence? That's a very good question. We do not know. Uh, if you have three different intelligence sources, the FSB, the SVR, and the GRU, can they all be wrong? So the FSB, uh, the Internal Security Service, which seems to dabble in foreign intelligence for some reason, but keep in mind in, 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 the, in Putin era Russia, uh, institutions don't stay in their lane very well, unlike in Soviet times. Uh, this is much more reminiscent actually of Nazi Germany in that regard. So the FSB, the SVR, the SVR of course, is the successor for the K of the KGB's foreign intelligence arm, the former first chief director of the KGB, the GRU, Russia's infamous military intelligence, the chief intelligence directorate of the general staff. Can they all be wrong? Well, if they're doing their jobs correctly, the answer is obviously no. However, there may be a cultural problem here, and that is uh, perhaps we could uh, 
you know, assume because there does seem to be evidence for this that what they're really doing amounts to to you to borrow a phrase from the Bush administration in the early 2000s, policy driven analysis. So if they're gearing everything that they produce by way of reporting to tell Putin what he wants to hear, that could be the source of the problem. And we've seen this before in Russia, we've seen this before in the Soviet Union. There's a bit of a history of this, and it's very disconcerting. Now, the next question is, did the military lead him astray about its real capabilities? Possibly, but the other question is, did the Russian military leadership understand the, the readiness of, it, of, the, of their own capabilities? Did they truly understand the state of the ground forces and that they were nowhere near ready for this type of operation? Hard to say. It's very easy to watch a huge military parade in on Victory Day trundling through Red Square and get a completely false idea of the capabilities of one's own military. Does Putin live in an echo chamber? A number of analysts and people in the know seem to believe this is the case, that he talks to very few people, uh, he has surrounded himself with yes men, and he's fallen into the classic trap of, of a, an authoritarian leader where he has begun to believe his own propaganda. He has forgotten who this propaganda was meant to deceive, and it's ended up deceiving him. Uh, this is not new in the world of authoritarian leaders, but it, it leads to a big problem. Because if Putin is thoroughly divorced from reality, things could go very wrong. Now, many who have known Putin see him as increasingly erratic and detached from reality. This is also not a good sign for someone with access to thermonuclear weapons. Putin is the gambler accustomed to a winning streak who just went all in and lost. And now he doesn't know what to do because he hasn't been in this type of situation before. And this all comes perhaps from really from the, the, the czarist Soviet Putin era narrative. Uh, you know, uh, one, one uh, senior West European official referred to this as Putinism, but in fact, it really is the Russian narrative about Russia from czarist times through Soviet times up to the present. And there are some key elements to it that have to be addressed. It's an entire geopolitical view that distorts reality considerably. <laughs> According to this narrative, Russia is always threatened. So therefore, of course, we need a dictator and a huge security apparatus because, of course, when you're threatened, you have to people have to pull together. The only way to get people to pull together is to have a uh, an authoritarian ruler banging his fist on the desk and a security apparatus threatening to shoot people. That always works. So Russia is always threatened. That's the first part of the narrative. The second part of the narrative, strangely enough, and in contradiction, is yet somehow Russia is also mighty and to be feared. Okay, that's odd. Russia is exceptional and has a great destiny, but also has a deep inferiority complex. And Russia demands respect, damn it. Where the word, where the idea of respect and the idea of being feared are, seem to be synonyms. So it's not respect from contributing to the human condition; it's respect from being feared. Now, Russia, because of all of this, Russia follows a consistent pattern of passive-aggressive behavior on the international stage. It becomes the spoiler, and even sees itself as the spoiler, as some some uh, Putin-era officials have commented. It's the country that drags everybody else down. The big question here, here, though, analytically, is time is on whose side? So let's have a look at that. For Russia, they have a problem. Their offensive operations have stalled on all axes, as we've said. Their ability to take Kiev is very doubtful at this point. Their combat losses are killing their military's reputation, which has begun to essentially turn out to be, turned out to be the equivalent of the performance of the Soviet army in the winter war against Finland. It will take years to restock the lost vehicles, missiles, etc. And when I say years to restock, what I'm talking about is even before sanctions. With the current sanctions, they have absolutely no possibility, realistically, of replacing these lost vehicles, missiles, aircraft, etc. <clears throat> in the next few years. It won't happen. And they have been burning through their stockpiles of precision guided mun munitions, whether land launched ballistic missiles. Uh, land and air launched cruise missiles or air to surface precision guided munitions they've been burning through their stockpiles very quickly it will take a long time and a lot of money to replace and they have neither casualties will create domestic pressure because the more the casualties build up the more russians will be asking well my 
my husband, father, brother, son died for what? This will create domestic pressure as it did during the Afghan conflict that led to the partly to the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, the other part of that domestic pressure is more and more people, more and more uh, combat veterans will be coming home from the front and will be telling the truth. They will be contradicting the official narrative of the propaganda. Then there's the economy plunging into recession. The economy is facing a deep recession. Uh, stores of goods are going to run out. Eventually, we're going to see massive unemployment, uh, massive inflation, and yes, there is no prospect of this improving in any way, shape, or form. Domestic support appears weak to begin with. That's a big problem. And more manpower is unlikely to help. So even if Putin is able to scrounge up more manpower, perhaps out of his 2 million man military reserve, it's unlikely these people can be usefully channeled into units and unlikely they'll be able to execute military tasks in any efficient manner at all. So Russia has a problem. Time is clearly not on Putin's side, not at all. So the longer Putin stays, the less likely he is to survive politically. But let's look at Zelensky. President Zelensky, he has no shortage of manpower. He can easily say to the Russians, look, you guys started this with maximum of 200,000 troops. Well, I have 2 million people under arms. Heck, I have 20 million people under arms and they're all waiting for you. So there is no shortage of manpower. There is no shortage of the right weapons. And uh, Western precision guided weapons, particularly anti-tank resources like Javelin and NLAW and anti-air resources, man portable anti-aircraft systems such as Stinger have made a huge difference as well. Ukraine has high morale and national unity. Its ability to outlast Russia's ground assault, very likely at this point. Increasing civilian casualties from the Russian terror campaign, this is perhaps the one political pressure on, on, uh, on Zelensky and Ukrainian decision makers. And it's perhaps the one source of leverage the Russians have at the moment. There is, of course, related to that, the humanitarian disaster of roughly 3.3 million Ukrainians who have fled the country, most of them to the European Union. This, however, is not a political pressure on, on President Zelensky. It's actually kind of great. It, the more civilians that get out of harm's way, the better. Uh, in these 3.3 million people who have fled to Western Europe, these people will be taken care of. They will have food, they will have shelter, they will have medicine. Yes, it's been very traumatic for them, which is unfortunate, but hopefully they'll be able to, uh, you know, to return home uh, within a few months. And it, for them, at least, it is not the end of the line. There are, of course, another 6.5 million Ukrainians who have been internally displaced. And there's a certain amount of pressure there. And that's a situation that can't be rectified until hostilities are concluded. Uh, there is continuing infrastructure, ongoing damage to Ukrainian infrastructure. Is that really a problem? Well, actually, a lot of infrastructure damage can be repaired quite quickly, sometimes within uh, days or weeks, um, as long as the funding is there. And of course, after hostilities are terminated, and some, some infrastructure damage can be repaired very, very quickly indeed. Uh, and some of the infrastructure damage Russia does is not to its own advantage. If you're spending a multi-million dollar cruise missile to crater a runway, it isn't a good exchange. A few hundred dollars in a, an hour of time will fill that hole. So the cost of rebuilding the country, now Russia has taken considerable pains to shatter uh, Ukrainian infrastructure, essentially to try to make Ukraine no, no longer viable as a state, as an independent state. Uh, does this really work? Well, it really isn't, isn't a huge pressure on President Zelensky because he knows that as soon as hostilities end, there will be a lot of money coming in to help rebuild his country. Then we have to talk about sanctions, just to conclude here. Um, now, if the, West if the West wishes to declaw the bear, then certain things have to happen. And this is what the West should be looking at because really this uh, czarist Soviet and Putinist uh, worldview has to end. It has to end. It's, a, it's an obsolete 19th century worldview, uh, as many people have said, that presupposes you have essentially empires vying for control of as much of the globe as they can possibly get their hands on. So you have these big, large multinational entities 
uh, surrounded by their buffer states that compete against each other. A very 19th century view and one which Europe dispensed with after the Second World War when it instituted a win-win relationship among all nations under a rule of law. So the rules-based international order, which Putin rejects, is the actually the only thing that can really save Russia. Now, if the West wishes to declaw the bear, then even if Russia withdraws, sanctions must remain in place. Or they could be conditionally rolled back if and only if, and there would have to be some very strict conditions on this. And, you know, before we get into the conditions, it's very important to understand that Russia has been functionally at war with the West for over, pretty much a decade already. It's just that this has been low level. This has been, been behind the scenes. This has been Russia's hybrid warfare. First of all, Russia would have to renounce the use of force against its neighbors and demilitarize its international borders with Ukraine, the Baltic countries, Georgia, etc. Now, no one would trust Russia to renounce use of force. Obviously, this would have to be monitored by international peacekeeping forces. There would have to be essentially a demilitarized zone. There would have to be security guarantees for Ukraine. Ukraine would want those guarantees, both from the Russian Federation and definitely from the West. <clears throat> Russia would have to stop its aggressive use of assassination on foreign soil, stop its political influence operations, stop its cyber warfare and its disinformation campaigns. These things have been endless. They've been, uh, the pace of these has been staggering in recent years, certainly since 2014. It's time for the West to put its foot down, and the West has the leverage to do so. It just needs to find the spine to do so. So the West needs to contain or end the Kremlin's destructive 19th century ideology, or Russia will continue to be a danger to its neighbors. There is no doubt about that. A few humorous items, because in the middle of a war, everybody needs some humor. As you know, the Ukrainians are great at changing road signs. The Russian ground forces don't seem to have access to GPS or their own equivalent Glosnas, which means they get easily lost. However, some, some road sign changes are more humorous than others. There is notably this one, which actually contains obscenities. It basically says this. The first one says, yes, go F yourself. This, the one below it says, go F yourself again. And the, the one below it says, go back to Russia and F yourself. One of my favorites, uh, Russia, this one says, Russian soldier, you are not welcome here. Go home to your family. From this point on, you're in hell. And, well, this one, I guess, is my favorite. Loosely translated, <laughs> sign up for the hot tour of Ukraine. See Ukraine and die, cocktails included. So there we are. And Putin probably should have paid more attention to the Ukrainian national anthem, which does say, which means our souls and bodies will lay down for our freedom. The line after that also says, and we will show that we are the brothers and sisters of the Cossack race. He should have taken that into account. So this has been the leader revolution. This has been our weekly update for decision makers on the Ukraine-Russia situation. Uh, stay strong, support Ukraine and relief efforts any way you can. And if you want to do a deeper dive into this, feel free to get in touch with me. I can certainly do that with you. Uh, that's it for now. I'm Dr. Simeon Roger, and we will see you next time.